Hey everyone, uh, thanks for uh, everyone for joining. Today we'll be talking about uh, we'll be having our second webinar about validating LLP data uh, and models. For those of you who've attended our previous web, uh, webinar, uh, we have uh, made some significant upgrades to the NLP testing package, uh, including adding new checks and new capabilities. So uh, stay tuned for the demo on the second part of this uh, of this presentation. Um, before before we start, just a, cu a couple of uh, Words of introduction, um, I'm, I'm Noam, I lead the machine learning uh, team here at DeepChex. Uh, joining me here today is Yaron, our VP product, uh, which is today uh, is promoted to panelists in this webinar. I mean, uh, he'll be uh, answering your questions and, uh, uh, and sending a couple of polls over the course of the webinar. Um, but, you know, throughout the, uh, the whole of this webinar, feel free to uh, send to send questions, ask questions, and answer the poll. We want we want the, this to be as a, as open as possible, and we'll be very glad to answer your questions. A couple of words about deep checks for those those who don't know us. Uh, what we do is we build a, 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 a suite of products for continuous validation of machine learning systems. Um, our two main offerings are first the uh, open source package for testing of machine learning models and data. This is the, uh, the product we'll be talking about today, and we'll be showing a, a, a significant live demo of it. Uh, our second pro product, DeepCheck Hub, is an on-prem and SaaS product for uh, monitoring your machine learning uh, machine learning pipelines in production. Uh, we won't be covering it in this talk, but if anyone uh, is interested in hearing more, you're more than welcome to contact me or your own uh, after this uh, after this webinar. Um, a couple of words about what uh, DeepCheck's package currently supports tabular computer vision and the new capability which we'll be discussing today is NLP, which is uh, now in, in uh, beta. Um, so what we'll be uh, talking about today. Um, I'll start by uh, giving a couple of words of motivation about what, uh, what kind of problems we expect to encounter when building machine learning uh, models uh, in, on NLP, in an NLP setup on, on text data. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about how we approach uh, validating and testing for these issues at DeepChecks and what is our, like the philosophy of our solution. Uh, we'll head on to the, to the main part of this webinar, which is the hands-on hands -on demo. We'll show uh, how we can use uh, the, the new package uh, to, to find these kind of issues and how does it work. And we'll, we'll finish by sharing some of our future plans uh, for the package and we'll very much like your feedback at this stage. Any of you that um, dealt with building and deploying machine learning pipelines, you know there's a couple of stages that are a bit uh, different than uh, tr building traditional software products. Uh, every machine learning pipeline starts by acquiring data. Many will say it's the most important part of the pipeline. Um, then, of course, after you acquire data, you process it, you join it, you do some, uh, you, you curate it. You want you want to train your model or your models. Uh, you want to compare them, you want to select the best model for the task and, and ensure that it uh, achieves your goals. And th then finally, you'll deploy to, pro you know, you'll hopefully deploy to production uh, where your model will, will serve its purpose, either customers or any internal use case. And of course, this whole process will likely repeat itself. Uh, you you re retrain your model in, in light of new data and in new of new situations. In any one of, of, um, of these stages, uh, there are a couple of, of things that uh, will typically or can typically go wrong. In the, in the data domain, uh, there are a lot of data integrity issues that we, as data scientists, enc encounter. Uh, we can have out, we can have the outliers uh, samples that don't match what the model don't match or don't help uh, the model to, to to train the specific task that you're trying to train it for. Uh, you'll have issues within with, with labels. You want you'll have wrong labels or data la labels. You'll have inconsistencies in the format of the data, which may impede the training. When we talk about uh, uh, data distribution, um, we will we, we'll, we'll, uh, be reminded that training and, pro and production or training and test are not the same thing. And the differences either in the distribution between the, our training data and our testing or production data or issues such as leakage uh, may, be, uh, may be very de detrimental to the performance of our, of our models. Finally, when we go to test our models before we uh, move them into production, uh, first of all, we can encounter simple performance degradation from between training and test or training and production. But we can also have 
uh, performance degradation that happens only in, in specific sub-segments of the data. No, it may not be evident when just looking at plain performance metrics. Uh, so these are all issues we I mean, kind of, I'll, give, I'll give a couple of examples for how this looks in, in NLP models. And uh, later on, we'll see how we can uh, catch these uh, issues. First example, this, this is an example to, taken straightly from the uh, Twitter da data set that we'll be showing in the demo. And not all, it's very likely that NL, your NLP model will be based on some kind of neural network or transformer. BERT is one very common, uh, very common choice. And not all tokenizers can handle all, all characters of all, all words. Um, here, for example, uh, we have a couple of, of words and characters that the tokenizer can't handle. And that's something that you, not only you should check because it can impact the whole performance of your model, that's something you can check before you even select your tokenizer or your model. So running tests for stuff like this for data integrity issues uh, is something you should, you should do the moment you get, you get hands um, you get you, you get hand of the data. Um, second, very uh, important issue uh, when uh, talking about uh, about uh, training models and especially models in production is the issue of drift. Uh, here, I break it into two um, broad categories: data, data drift and concept drift. Well, the, when the distinction is that data drift is a situation in which the distribution of the data itself has changed. While concept drift is not only the distribution of the data has changed, but the relation between the label, the, the, let's say the property I'm trying to pre predict, and the data itself has changed. And because my model is training to uh, detect uh, Y uh, as dependent on X, a change in this distribution, in this uh, joint distribution, is something that uh, must require me to retrain my model. Uh, if I can give a, a quick example, let's say I'm trying to predict the, the price of a house, let's say I'm some kind of real estate company in New York, let's say. Uh, data drift would be change, would be a change in which we have more, people are building more small apartments, so there are more small apartments in the city. On the face of that's a change in the data, but on, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that my model has a problem. Uh, it could be that my model is okay on predicting on large homes and on small homes. And in that case, a change in, and change in which there are more small homes doesn't necessarily mean my model is and uh, now unfit for its task. On the other hand, let's say that this change of more small apartments has happened because more students and more young people are, are moving into the city. In that case, not only that there'll be more small apartments, but also the price of small apartments will rise. So now for the same house, for the same small apartment, the why, the price is different. So we encountered not only data drift, but concept drift. And that's something which means we probably must train our, retrain our model on new data in which this new phenomenon is happening. I'll note that um, when you don't have access to your labels, you, you can't tell the difference between concept drift and data drift, and that's what, why you should be wary on every instance of data drift that you encounter in your data. And we'll talk about how you can detect it, um, especially use, using deep checks. Um, another quick example of data drift in the context of, of NLP, let's say you're uh, Testing for you're uh, trying to predict uh, brand awareness or the sentiment associated with it, with, with certain terms. So in general, uh, uh, Twitter has a certain uh, uh, certain uh, amount of search of search hits, certain sentiment. Data drift would be uh, that's this incident here around the end of uh, 2022 is the Elon Musk uh, takeover of Twitter and the, and the big uh, firing that you may uh, recall. So data drift will be the fact that Twitter is now trending high. You have many more people looking for Twitter. That's just change the distribution of the search terms over time. The concept drift here is the fact that suddenly Twitter, which was more uh, uh, joined with positive terms with hiring, with growth, is now uh, appearing together with the Twitter firing and with more negative sentiments. So there's been a, a concept drift in the relation between and Twitter and let's say emotion and why people are looking for, for this term. Another example for a common issue that you may encounter is shortcut learning. And let's have an example. Let's say you're training a model to assess how, how trustworthy a certain, uh, certain source is. And you take articles from Wikipedia as the trustworthy examples and articles from Reddit as the untrustworthy uh, examples. Um, as that seems fitting, Wikipedia is generally trustworthy and Reddit, well, is, you know. Um, but that will teach your model 
uh, that long texts are trustworthy and short texts um, are, are not so. And it will just learn this simple property rather than looking at the content. And the issue with that is, is when you move later to another data set to production to test, that relation would, won't hold, hold any, anymore. And why I'm noting this specific phenomenon, because that's again something you can detect even before you train your model. You can just test for rela uh, relations between some set, uh, simple properties and, um, and your label. And we'll show examples for that. Uh, Yaron still is video on, which means we have some questions from the crowd. Oh. Well, no. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we have one. You can continue. We would like to run some polls, of course. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we'd be very glad if you can answer some of our polls. Well, that really help us uh, direct the, uh, the the next our next steps uh, in developing the, the NLP package for deep checks. Yeah. So actually, the first one we'll ask is um, which tasks do you um, do you handle uh, or do you perform today with NLP? Um, and you can answer that while while Noam is continuing to to talk about this and. Uh, before the next section, we'll have uh, one more uh, question to ask you. Great, thanks, Yaron. I'll note that uh, that's a good uh, like uh, interjection because I'll note that currently the package supports um, text classification, uh, multi-label multi token uh, text classification, of course, as well, and a token classification. But we're working on adding additional task types, and your input here will, will be very valuable on deciding uh, which uh, which way we go next. Um, final um, example here of uh, common issues um, uh, with the uh, models and data, especially in NLP, is ch change or model degradation in a specific segment. So let's say you're trying to predict brand awareness, and you, we're looking at Netflix, and you're trying to see, uh, trying to predict how, how people, are, how much people are interacting with this brand, how much are they uh, projected to buy based on uh, on our say, or on the our analysis. So in general, people noting uh, Netflix and talking about Netflix, probably they're watching Netflix, and that's a good indicator. That means they're watching uh, content on Netflix, they are subscribers, or they will go to sub subscribe next. Specifically, here we have a segment and a phenomenon that happened in a specific segment of young people where uh, Netflix has uh, taken a, a different uh, turn. And when someone says, want to come over for Netflix and chill, they, that, although it's a positive sentiment, it doesn't uh, indicate in any way that someone is going to purchase and Netflix subscription. So that's kind of a linguistic drift or a change in the language. It happens in a specific segment. And if we don't look at this specific segment and look at our results there, we won't know that this change has happened and that our model is now predicting a fake brand awareness based on this data. And we'll, so we'll see some other examples for that in our demo. Um, before I, I move on to the how to find them part, uh, any questions from the crowd about um, about uh, problems we displayed so far, about uh, issues uh, in uh, NLP data models. Uh, if you have any, write them here and Yaron will uh, relay them to me. Yaron, anything so far? There's one question, but I believe that you should, um, um, I'll, I'll end this uh, question poll in a second. And I would suggest to answer the first question after you fi finish the first section of talking about what we actually do, because it relates uh, to this. Okay, so perfect. So let, oh. let, let, let's get on. Yep. Um, okay, so in general, uh, we break down types of issues that we, as we, I think, have shown before, we break down the, the kinds of issues that you may encounter into integrity on the, on the, on the one side, and uh, stuff uh, regarding distribution of the data and performance over distribution on the other side. What's a key difference here? When we're talking about integrity, most of the time we're talking about issues that, that happen within a specific sample. Let's say you have problematic tokens that a certain tokenizer can't, can't uh, handle, or you have bad characters. Um, there'll be there'll, that stuff that happens for, in a specific sample or in specific samples, and you can analyze them independently. When we're talking distribution, Let's say I want to know what's the difference in aggregate between a certain body of text and another body of text. I have no way to do that based on the text itself. Text is an unstructured data type. And I can't just look at its distribution. I have to transform it into something else. That's why our approach here in, for integrity checks, we keep, we keep the original uh, text, we keep it unstructured. 
And uh, we, when we're talking about distribution and performance, we transform uh, the text into a structured, into structured data, which means some kind of a vector or number, or either a vector or number or category, like tabular data. Uh, I'll just note on the side note that this is the approach that works not only for text, but also for other data types, for images, for, uh, for audio, audio, but we'll, we'll cover here uh, text specifically. So uh, if we drill down, what we do uh, is we, uh, we, we extract se several, pro several items from our, from our text. First, we, have, we uh, join our text with metadata. Second, we extract certain named and um, understandable properties from our, uh, our, our text itself. And lastly, we project our text into an embedding space using some model, uh, which enables us to perform uh, analysis that we couldn't do without it. I'll dive into each of one, each one of them shortly. So what is metadata? Uh, metadata is simply some kind of data that comes with uh, the text. It has something to do with the way text, the text was generated or collected. So it could be the source of the text, the website, a data source, could be the creation date when what uh, this, uh, let's say, tweet uh, tweeted. And it could be demographics. What's the age of the user? What country? What city do they come from? Um, and that's something that uh, can, can come in the data. It's very useful for segmentation. Properties, on the other hand, are uh, numbers or categories that can be extracted from the text itself. They characterize the text itself. They can be very simple properties, like the length of the text, the average word length, the uh, number of special characters, the ratio of special characters to regular characters, and so on. Can be a bit more complex properties, which are linguistic. Let's say what language the text is, the text is in or a number of nouns, for example, or lexical complexity of the text. Um, finally, we have, uh, let's say, more uh, 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 properties deal with the tone of the domain of the text, uh, such as sentiment or register, which is the formality of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the text itself. It could be the fluency of the text, could be the toxicity. We'll see a couple of examples. The common point here is all of these are properties that can be extracted directly from the text, and they describe the text for us in a way that we can understand and we can do the statistical analysis on. Finally, we have embeddings. For those of you that didn't encounter that in depth, embeddings are projections of our text into some vector dimension. From each sample, we produce a vector of numbers. And we typically do that using some, one of the final layers of a model of a deep neural network. Common way to get embeddings would be either using your own model, a model trained on your task, and then the embeddings produced will probably be very appropriate for your task type. Or uh, alternatively, you can use some kind of, uh, nowadays they're called foundation model, some kind of model trained on a, on a lot of data from, you know, with a very, um, let's say, generalizable task type. And in this case, embeddings produced by such a model may be useful for analyzing a lot of different, uh, of different task types. Uh, we can give, for example, here for the first, it could be the sentence transformer uh, models, and it could be, uh, let's say, if we go to the more expensive end of the scale, it could be uh, embeddings generated by OpenAI, and um, which are generally very good for general use. So, just to recap, a couple of the, of the three methods and the advantages and disadvantages, metadata uh, is very good for segmentation because we usually very, care very much about um, succeeding or like having good model performance in, in all of our business segments, in all our different countries we operate in, on different age groups, on different data sources, and so on. So if we have this kind of information, it's, it, it's very useful to do analysis on, on, this, uh, on this information, understand if we have problematic segments within it. Uh, down, downside of it is it doesn't, it's not, doesn't always exist. You don't always have metadata. You don't always have the relevant metadata. Or, the metadata which makes the difference uh, in, in your specific case. Um, on the other hand, properties, um, the advantage is you can always get them, but you just compute them on the, on the raw text. And so you can always have properties and they're very, um, let's say explainable. Each property has a specific name. It means a specific thing. And if you have a body of text, let's say that is, that is significantly more, uh, toxic than a different body of text, then you, you know you have a problem and you know what, what the problem is. You know you have 
people are writing toxic stuff in your service. Uh, downside of properties, of course, that if your problem doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, let's say, happen in one of the properties that you happen to compute, then you won't catch, catch the issue. And finally, we have embeddings. And embeddings have the, the very strong advantage of uh, being more general. So generally speaking, in embedding space, if two samples are close in embedding space, they're also similar in some way. They'll be either they'll talk on about a, to a common subject. They'll be they'll be close in sentiments. They'll be close in the way they are structured. So um, embeddings can convey a lot of different types of information. And similarity or dissimilarity in, in embedding space are a very strong tool for analyzing distribution of text. And the big downfall of embeddings, apart from them being heavy to compute or expensive, is that they're not explainable. So if I know two samples are close together in embedding space, I, I know they're similar. I don't know why. I don't know what exactly is similar about them. And on the other hand, if there were two samples with the same property, I know, OK, they have the same number of words in the sentence. It's very, very easy to understand. So in the, in the, next, in the demo right now, we'll, we'll show how we use these three uh, ways to break an unstructured problem into a structured problem in order to detect various issues in the data. Um, I think here, Ron, that's a good time for questions and maybe also for our next, uh, for our next, next survey. So, yeah. So before we go to the next question, just reiterating the results of this one, classification is by far the number one task that people uh, use. And then, well, again, not a surprise, generative AI, generative AI, and then token classification, information retrieval, and unsupervised. So not really um, surprising. Um, the next, uh, the next thing I would like, Norm. So, the only question that came up uh, so far that I'd like you to uh, uh, kind of answer is whether uh, our model checks include population stability index. I would suggest to do that after uh, the hands-on demo. Um, yeah, or but I, I can answer it quickly while you send the, the other poll, uh, the next poll about about the common common uh, issues. Um, so yeah, uh, Yaron just sent a uh, survey about what are the most frequent issues you encounter uh, when training your NLP models. We'd very like, uh, very much like to to know that because uh, that maybe uh, affect our, our future development and what we focus on. Uh, regarding the question about population population stability index, we'll show it uh, shortly. But when we compute uh, drift on properties, which are essentially tabular uh, or let's say like features, like tabular features. Um, we do use we use a different uh, measure for categorical drift. We use a Kramer's V uh, test, but you can uh, tell our check to use population stability in index. So it's supported. You just need to pass it to the keyword, uh, to the drift method keyword in the check. And that's, uh, I think, short, uh, the so short answer. Uh, so uh, I think we arrived at it. Uh, let's start with a, ha a hands-on demo. Um, so you, you'll have to forgive me, I uh, already run all the cells in this notebook to save us some time, but trust me, nothing here takes more than, let's say, uh, 15 or, or, or 20 seconds to run, so you can ru also run it uh, locally, the, the link is in the presentation, and, and see the results for yourself. So what we'll do in, in this demo, we'll start by just showing the prerequisites for running deep checks, which are pretty minimalistic, but uh, you'll, you'll soon see and how you tell deep checks about your, your data and about your uh, task type. We'll then run the different built-in suites in the deep checks package. Um, suites are, are the basic components of, of deep checks are checks. Each one tests for a specific kind of issue that may happen in your data. A collection of, of checks is called a suite. And we have a couple of built-in suites for different uh, parts of your pipeline, data integrity, train test, model, uh, train test validation, and model evaluation. I will run each one of them and uh, we'll understand what, what happened in our data set. And we'll end uh, this demo by spotlighting two specific interesting, uh, in, very interesting and new checks, uh, the embedding drift, uh, which I think we promised during the previous webinar and is now, is now complete, and the under annotated segment check. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a special treat at the end. Um, so in order to, let's say uh, you start in this, a demo will start with a pretty simple data set. It's uh, the, the Twitter emotion data set in which the, the text itself is just text of tweets. 
And the label is the emotion displayed in the tweets, happiness, anger, uh, anger, happiness, optimism, and sadness. Um, on top of that, in this case, we have some metadata about the user. We have, we have the age, gender, days on the platform, and the, the region from which the, uh, the person was tweeting. Um, so let's say you start with this data set. What should you do in order to use deep checks? So first, I'm defining here the classes just for uh, future use. What you need to the first thing and the nearly the last thing you need to do is to define a text data object. Um, text data data object is just a uh, some kind of capsule for your data. Uh, it, it is used to contain the text, the label, and to tell us a bit about your data. So how we build it. You instantiate it by first giving it the text itself, just a list of strings. You give us the label, and you must tell us what task type are you using you, right now, either text classification or token classification, as I mentioned. Uh, of course, you can also just use the only text if you want, but then you won't get any checks that relate to the label itself. And um, finally, here we, we're passing the metadata columns uh, to the to the constructor constructor. Uh, so we can use them in our future checks. And uh, note that we're getting a warning that we had to auto infer the type of the metadata columns. In this case, the inference is correct. Gender and user region or categories, while these are numeric uh, columns. And um, but you you can also give uh, them yourself, and then you won't get the warning. So that's the recommended way to work. Um, after you define your, your data set, and here we uh, define the train and the test data set separately. And note about that, in this, in this use case, train and test are taken from two different uh, times. So train is something that uh, are tweets that happened earlier in time compared to test, and that's the source of the differences uh, we're going to see. Um, after you define your text data object, you you can, uh, it's very, very recommended that you add uh, properties to your data. That can be done in a general case by calling a uh, calculate default, property, default properties um, function, which will calculate the properties. If you want the more complicated one, you pass, uh, you pass this argument and GPU device if you have one, and it will calculate the properties for you. In this example, I'll just uh, load the already pre-calculated properties to save us some time. And um, so let's say, let's see what properties do we have. We have a couple of more simple ones, like you said, text length, max word length, uh, percent of special characters, etc. We also have some medium complexity, such as language or sentiment sub subjectivity. And we have some other uh, properties uh, produced by, by uh, com uh, commonly available hugging face mo uh, models, such as toxicity, fluency, and formality. Uh, finally, I'm, I'm very glad to say that we have uh, two, two uh, new properties, uh, lexical density and unique noun count. Uh, contributed by a member of our community, Harsh James. Uh, special thank to you, Harsh, if, you, if you're here. Um, also, since this was completed, Harsh also contributed two new properties. So we're very uh, glad and thankful for that. Um, okay, so once you have your properties defined, you're good to move on. So how do you run a deep check suite? That same syntax applies to um, any deep checks check or suite. You just import it, um, and then you can you create a suite, and you just run it. Here, I modified the parameters of a specific check, the outliers check, because I want uh, to show you a bit more properties. Um, so you invoke the, the run method, and you pass the two data sets to it. I know because it's a data integrity suite, you can also pass a single data set, and it will also work fine. And you'll get insights on the specific data set that you passed, because commonly in a, in the case of data integrity, you may want to run it uh, on your original data set, even before you do any kind of split. So, OK, we got a switch result. Cool. Let's see what we got. So first of all, um, an important uh, thing to note, I think, each of the checks in deep checks we can define uh, conditions on, which can either pass or fail. Um, this uh, pre-built suite comes already with pre-built conditions, with pre-built uh, thresholds for each condition. So what we'll be seeing here is the, fa is the fa things that failed on the default settings. Of course, you can configure everything, build your own suites, uh, define your own conditions, and define your own thresholds. So OK, let's see what we got. First of all, unknown, token, uh, unknown tokens check has failed. Let's see what happened. Seems we have some, uh, some um, specific tokens or characters that are not supported by the default uh, tokenizer, in this case, Bert, uh, Bert base uncased. 
Um, because we're dealing here with the emotion classification for Twitter, I think that that's pretty big, big failure because the, the emojis convey a lot of information about the emotion in the tweets. So uh, I think that failure of this check should mean that we should do something uh, pretty urgently to fix that situ situation. We'll also see other kinds of failed, uh, failed characters, such as uh, other emojis, Korean, uh, et cetera. We'll note that it's, only, it's less than 1% of the world that are failing this way, but I think it's still uh, very, very much worth uh, dealing with. Um, I know that, of course, you can configure this check to test any kind of tokenizer you want. That's just the default tokenizer that, that, that runs out of the box. Um, second, we have the text duplicate uh, check, which informs us that we have uh, one sample that is duplicate. Okay, that's not a big issue. It happens twice in the data set, but if we, you had a lot more duplicates, it may be a big issue that you want, you want to deal with because it can uh, bias the model towards a specific kind of sample. Uh, finally, we have a special character check uh, that tries to identify special characters in the check that may be problematic for certain models. We can see the emojis that were identified earlier and also some kind of special uh, punctuation marks that in some cases may, may prove an issue, an issue for, cer for certain models. That's why we define this uh, check. Okay, so these are the checks, checks that didn't pass. On the checks that passed, we have here a property label correlation. In this case, everything is okay. But what we try to do here is to, we try to predict the label based only on the properties we extract. And the logic being that, let's say, if perhaps the percent of special characters is very predictive of your label, then it's very likely that you have some kind of shortcut learning. In our case, the fact that sentiment and toxicity are a bit predictive of the emotion, that makes sense. So everything is okay in, uh, for now. And finally, I have a check that I like very much. It's the text, uh, text property outliers. What, we, what this check does, it displays a distribution of the properties in your data set and tries to find outliers. So in this case, uh, this, this is Twitter. So we do expect a lot of toxic uh, samples. And indeed, we have some. I won't show them for the uh, sake of proprietary, but you, you, it's Twitter. You know they're there. Um, another uh, interesting. Uh, I think uh, outlier from a uh, data, data integrity perspective is the, uh, very long words. Let's see, see the outliers here. You have very long words, which happen to be hashtags. And we can easily see how, how these hashtags are problematic for our model because our model doesn't, don't necessarily know how to break down these hashtags into the component words and may just ignore them. And these are important for the uh, correct identification of sentiments. So what we can do here is either break down these words out ourselves, or maybe we should delete them if we don't have anything better to do, because this can prove a problem. Uh, also, we have we can see in the low lexical density range, uh, th thanks again, Harsh, uh, we have some kind of some tweets that are, have just a lot of repeating words. And that's, again, may maybe something you want to deal with uh, in a real world scenario. OK. So that's a couple of um, data that's a couple of data integrity checks in that are implemented. Not some of them have passed, and we didn't uh, dwell on them. Let, so let's say you uh, run this on your on your data. You fixed all the problems. Now you produced some kind of of trained test split, or you have uh, production data that you want to compare to your training data. In that case, you can just import the train test validation suite and run it. Here, train test. That's all the lines you need. Um, what we'll, we'll get here, yeah, so let's see, the, first, the only one, only check that failed is the label drift check. Um, that's a label, that check just uh, computes the data drift in the label itself, the drift in the label itself between train and test. And we can see that you got, we got pretty high drift. And this is happening because in the test data sets, suddenly we have a lot more of optimism labeled, of samples labeled with optimism. So that's certainly something that is problematic uh, could be problematic for our model, but we need to see, did our model uh, handle that correctly? Or we'll see that shortly. Um, on the, on the uh, past section, we have uh, the property drift in our case here. We, we compute, that's where we compute drift in the properties between train and test. And we can see that property-wise, they're pretty similar. So uh, in this case, properties didn't uh, manage to 
find the significant, any significant changes between the training test data sets. Okay, that was uh, uh, pretty, pretty short. Let's see what happens next. Let's say we trained our model here. I'm getting the predictions and the probabilities of our classification model from a pre-computed uh, store. Let's say we have a model. It produces produced predictions and probabilities for our, 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 our train and test data set. We can now pass them to the model evaluation suite to test our model itself. Uh, in order to do, to do that, we just need to pass our data set and also predictions for train test probabilities. Probabilities, probabilities of course, are not mandatory. They're only needed for certain checks. Uh, and the model classes, which is useful uh, in cases where we want to tell the tell checks what are the names of my classes in case that it's not uh, explicitly stated in the data set itself. Okay, run the check, printed the result. Uh, I'll note here for anyone interested that results here are displayed in a notebook, but they can also be, of course, exported to HTML, to JSON, and to any other format that, that uh, works for you. So let's see what, what, what did we get. First of all, the most naive of checks, but the most important of them, uh, train test performance. Here we can see a significant decline in our recall uh, on the label optimism uh, in the test data set. That uh, tells us that our, uh, suspect, our suspicion, um, let's say, uh, suspicions were, uh, uh, were true. The increase in the label optimism uh, that we saw earlier means a lot of new samples of optimism that we don't know how to predict on. That, that's why we're getting very bad results on them. We can't, we, we're not managing to classify them as optimism samples. Um, that, uh, before we get to the next checks, I, I'll just say that we, that corresponds to this, to the results of the prediction drift check. This check has passed, but we still want to look at it because what do, what do we see here? We know already that the label, labels have changed a lot between train and test, but looking at the predictions, there's no significant change. It's still predicting pretty much the same classes between train, train and test. What we understand from here is that we have some kind of concept drift. We have the model is still predicting the same stuff, but the data has changed. So what do we know now? We have some kind of new samples that are about optimism, but our model is not managing to identify them. That's what we have learned so far. To dive into, I think, two other checks, which are pretty cool, in my opinion, um, we have the segment performance checks, two, one for properties and one for metadata. Looking at the, at the, property, uh, the property segment performance, so this check uh, tries to break down uh, your data by and segmenting on your properties and identifying uh, specific subsegments of your data that are weak uh, compared to the rest of the data. What do I mean by weak? They have worse performance significantly. So here we can see that um, the model is failing a lot for low toxicity samples. My personal theory here, I think the model is using the toxic toxicity of comments in order to identify certain classes such as anger. And when toxicity is not present, then the model is having a harder time correctly predicting the label. So that's why lower toxicity samples have very bad performance comparatively. Moving on to, to the next version of this same check, we run the same algorithm, but this time on the metadata columns. And what do we get, we get here? We can see that our model has, has a specific and severe problem uh, looking on um, new, new mem new users from the Americas. So we have users with very few days on platform, and they're from the Americas. And in this uh, segment, which is nearly 6% of the data, we're having very bad accuracy. So something is happening there, maybe some kind, of, some kind of new slang that we don't know about. Something is happening there that is really impeding the performance, the performance of our model. Um, another segment that this check identifies is that we have um, a problem with users from, from Europe, which are young. Um, again, it could be some kind of new slang or that users are using their own native language from Europe uh, and our model is not really uh, built for, to, uh, to work with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with this uh, other languages or other ty types and types of speech. Um, okay, so th that's, that's, uh, that will be our evaluation checks. Um, I think the 
so we learned so far we have problems with the new optimism samples and we learned that we have some weak segments which is something we probably want uh, to fix once we have time to uh, to further develop our model uh, any questions so far uh, Yaron, have we do we have anything um first of all um the uh, time for the poll is past you so I'll, I'll keep it alive for the next 30 seconds or a minute or so. Uh, if you still haven't answered, uh, please answer. This is going to impact, you can actually impact our uh, roadmap. Um, the voting has an impact. The voting of the, of the previous, uh, uh, of the previous uh, the webinar was already taken into account in, uh, in developing some of the stuff that Noam was uh, relating to uh, in, in this conversation. Um, Okay, so on questions, um, give me a second. There's um, there is a question about uh, um, what uh, Python version or versions or, or you would uh, recommend to use with uh, DeepChecks. Yeah, so basically, DeepCheck is is tested every release on all versions from uh, three point six to three point nine. So you should be okay. Um, also, also, I imagine we, we don't test for it yet, but I imagine it will be also good for 3.10. 3 and um, of course, uh, you'll, be, you'll have an easier time uh, installing using uh, more advanced dependencies such as uh, PyTorch and Transformers on the, let's say, 3.7 and, and, and later versions. But ev everything should work. We have another question? Yes. Um, can it handle Hebrew? <laughs> can it handle Hebrew? So th that, that's a good question. Currently, the, the built-in properties that we have, um, some of them are uh, built only to deal with English, English language uh, text. Uh, let's say the sentiment, toxicity, all these kind of properties. So we don't, have, uh, we, we don't have support for Hebrew yet. Some of the properties, of course, are general, uh, like uh, length, length or count of nouns, stuff like that uh, should work uh, generally. Also, of course, metadata you bring by your own. Uh, is is a is, will work regardless of language. A note on a, a final note here is you're also welcome to create your own properties in a form of a CSV or a data data frame and pass them to DeepChecks, and then DeepChecks can do all the analysis, drift segments, uh, outliers, everything based on your own properties. So you, you don't have to uh, limit yourself to the properties that we uh, currently support in the package. Okay. Cool. Um, have uh, before we move forward, just in terms of the uh, poll results, sharing them right now, um, the most frequent issue uh, that people see, well, actually two, drift and tokenization issues. And then uh, we have the rest. Uh, surprisingly, shortcut learning is the lowest one. Yeah, we'll take into account. Um, cool. So, and, and final note here, uh, I've shown you the examples of using each one of the suite of the suites independently, because um, that's the way we recommend to use them in each stage of your development, when you have your data, when you have your split, and when you develop your model, uh, we recommend to run the appropriate suite or checks at each stage. But let's say you want, you want to, you already have a model, you want to find, to run this kind of final validation before maybe uploading the model to production or, uh, or stuff like that. We ha also have a full suite, which contains all the uh, recommended checks uh, in one suite alongside the default conditions and thresholds. So you can also use it that way. Okay. Um, I want to dive into the embedding drift check, which is, will be extra interesting here, I think. Um, but I'll use this also as a, let's say, a didactic moment to show you how you can use an independent check in deep checks. So far, I've only, sh only shown how you can use the full su uh, use suites, which are a collection of checks. Here, it's pretty simple. You just import the check itself um, from deep checks. You instantiate it here, and then you run it. In this case, it's, it's a drift check, so you want to compare the train data set to the test data set, or the train data set to your production data set. Um, yeah, very simple API. Uh, just note before you run the embedding, uh, this uh, embedding drift check, you must uh, define embeddings. So in this case, I'm loading embeddings from 
um, from a pre-saved, from already saved uh, source. But what you can do is use our calculated default embeddings and method to calculate them yourself. Uh, the default to be using a sentence transformer, an open source implementation, but you can also, if you have an open AI key configured on your machine, you can just uh, send here the string open AI, sorry, for the Hebrew. Like that, um, and it will compute uh, embeddings using the adder to uh, uh, embedding endpoint or, uh, from OpenAI. Okay, cool. So that, that's uh, that's actually what we used in this example because uh, there there are no way no way around it. There are better than just using an open uh, the center transformer right now. So we just run a check, and what what do we get? We get a, a, a plot, a, a two dimensional representation of the embedding space. Um, I'll just expand it a bit so you can see the here. You, you can see right the uh, partition to dataset, train dataset samples, and test dataset samples. And we also get a drift score. In this case, uh, let's say not very high drift, but medium drift, which maybe a, a, it's a sure a reason to investigate. And um, I have a slide just after this uh, demo. I will talk a bit about how we computed this drift score, but I won't get into it right now. So what we could, what can we see in, in this plot? So first we see there's the central body of text, uh, which is let's say kind of evenly distributed between train and test. So it's the space in which there is no drift. Then we have several clusters that are distinctly more, have more samples from train or more samples from, from test. So let's explore them. First here we have a sample that is more representative of train. And here we have uh, Rangers versus, versus Celtic. We have Matthew Donson. We have we have other uh, tweets talking about sports. So this is a sport, uh, sport uh, tweet cluster. And we can see it, it, it is dominant, dominated by test samples, which means probably there was some kind of sport event uh, that happened during the time frame in which the train data set was collected. And uh, in the time frame of the test, test data set, we have uh, less samples talking about sports. Um, another uh, interesting cluster that we have here is a cluster uh, that is mainly about uh, mainly from the test data set. And if we look here, we see here relentless, never quit. You see, you won't find excuses if you seek optimism. You see, uh, let's not become wary in doing good. We have all kind of inspirational quotes uh, in this cluster. And we note that all of these samples are about, not most of them at least, are about optimism. And most of them belong to the test data set. So, I think this is the sample that is uh, leading, uh, leading, creating trouble for us. This is a sample of inspirational quotes that, that suddenly appeared in, in the test data set, probably some kind of trend or, or thought leadership that happened during the time of the, of the test data set. Um, and that's what caught, and we know that our model has problem predicting the correct label for these samples because we know already that we have a lot of new samples whose true label is optimism, but who the model is not uh, does not manage to correctly classify. So that's our uh, specific uh, specific culprit here in the degraded performance of our model. Just note um, other uh, interesting examples here. We have a cluster talking about I think a specific uh, terror attack or some kind of fight happening in uh, in, in in South, South uh, Asia. Um, that's probably relating to some event that happened specifically during the time of the test data set. So this in general is a very useful tool uh, for understanding what kind of clusters are unique to a train or test data set and for understanding in a more uh, content oriented way what exactly happened and what change, changes happened in your data set. You can use it, of course, in that way. You can also just look at a score and inspect it only when it exceeds a certain threshold. That way, you don't have to look at it each time you run deep checks, the deep check suites or checks, but only when something happens. And on to our next check. And last no, check. No, yeah. no, before we move to that, there is a question from uh, Ronnie. How is the drift calculated for an embedding space, an averaging or some of some distance function or something else? Great question. I have a slide on that in two minutes. So stay with us. Um, so last check for this, this demo is the under-annotated segment check, uh, which I, which I uh, like very much. 
Uh, I also use this opportunity to show you how you can define a condition on a check. You just do the add condition. And if you don't state a threshold, it will use the default threshold. So we just define this check, run it on the uh, That's a test data set that I messed a bit, uh, messed a bit with. Uh, when you define a condition, you also get um, the condition status here uh, above the check. Here it failed because we, we did find a very significant under annotated segment. So what can we see here? Uh, red samples are not and uh, samples that are not annotated. Green are annotated. The blue square is the part is the problematic segment, and we can see here that compared to the rest of the data set in which ninety percent of the data is annotated, here only less than sixty percent is annotated. So what happened here? This is specifically for low formality, low fluency samples. So let, let's think why that could that happen. Maybe. I guess we sent it uh, in the most typical use case, we'll send it to some kind of annotation service. And it's very, very likely that our annotators have a problem annotating samples that are, uh, let's say, less fluent, less formal, just more slangy. People are they're probably leaving them out or leaving them as unknown. And that's why we have a lot of un annotated samples here. And that if this segment is important for us and for our uh, business task, then we'll probably uh, want to send this to re-annotation or put more effort or more uh, train our, our annotators in annotating this specific kind of data. And that's something that will be very hard to uncover without some such such a segment analysis because you know in general you have 90% of your data annotated. So in general you'll think that the situation is okay, but in a certain subsegment of data that's not the case. Um, okay. I'll just so well, there is one more question. Um, yeah. Bar, I think, wants to ask a question in, uh, in their voice. So I'll just allow them to talk. And, and Bar, if you would like to uh, ask the question, now is the time. Yeah, hey, Bar. Nope. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, there's no, no, I, did, I didn't mean to ask any, anything. So. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I'll switch back to, to our presentation. Um, and ju just a few words, I'll just answer, un answer the question here about how we calculate the drift score for embedding drift. What we do is we train what we call a domain classifier. And domain classifier is basically a model that you train, uh, instead, of to train instead of training it to identify the original label of the task, you train it to distinguish between samples that belong to the train and the test data set. So you'll take um, two tables, one uh, from the training set with all the features, embeddings in our case, and the label, which is, let's say, zero for all samples from the training set, and then another table of all the samples from the test set labeled one. Then you'll join them together, you'll split them, you'll train, train test and validation, and now you'll train a model to distinguish the two. The logic being uh, yeah, that if, sorry, that if the model succeeded in, in, um, in distinguishing between train and test sample, samples based on the embeddings, it means that the, there is some significant difference between train and test data sets. Um, but if the model dis, that doesn't succeed, and which means low AUC in our case, it, it probably means that there's no uh, strong difference in the embedding space between train and test. So that's, uh, and the score that you'll get is just a, a simple com computation. It's, Two, two, two times the AUC minus one. So it's a normalization of the, of the model AU, domain classifier AUC into the zero to one uh, range. So th that's simply it. Um, okay, cool. Uh, Yaron, I think it may be time for, an, for our last poll. Um, so, so, yeah, a so couple of words about our next steps. I think Yaron, you can share the, uh, yep. the survey in the meantime. Um, Stuff, the next steps that we're uh, working on and consider, um, considering working on also depends on your, on your feedback. First of all, we want to support more use cases. Like, like we said, currently we, we support uh, cl classification, text classification and token classification when token classification is, is a, a, bit, a bit less supported right now and we need to improve that, that support. But also we want to add, of course, uh, the next task in line, which I think information retrieval alongside uh, uh, as we see from your uh, input today, also ge generative is an important uh, use case to support. Uh, on top of that, we want to expand the cap capabilities of the package itself. 
Uh, for example, we want to be able uh, to detect the dirty labels, not only uh, unannotated segments. Um, we want to be able to uh, detect duplicates, not only strict duplicates, but similar samples, perhaps using embeddings. And we want to continue on improving our embedding drift check. For example, right now we had to use the hover to understand the topics of each one of the, of the, of the segments and of the clusters that we saw there. But that's something that we think can be improved significantly uh, algorithmically. So these are a couple of our next stages. We'd be also uh, very glad to hear uh, any, other, any other suggestions. Um, of course, for, for suggestions, of course, you're very welcome to contact us, uh, whether it's in, in our community Slack, uh, just email us here at Norma Deep Checks or Yorona Deep Checks, uh, or you know, even open, open issues in our GitHub uh, project, uh, open issues, and of course, uh, we're open to comp contributions. The full release um, will be on the 22nd of, uh, of May, and in, in two weeks' time. Um, but of course, after that, will there also be significant improvements after the, the the formal release. So there's a lot to look forward to. Um, finally, a couple of words of thanks. Thanks for Nadav and Neil, for my team, for actually doing all the work uh, that, I've, that I've shown so far, and even building significant parts of this presentation. And again, special, special thanks to Harsh Jane uh, our uh, community con contributor, uh, may we, yeah, we, we really enjoyed your contribution and the, uh, and the properties that you added, and I think they'll be of great use to the community. So many thanks. Um, oh, you're on. Any, uh, do we have any final questions? Well, um, people, not everyone has uh, answered, and really, this is we're seriously going to uh, take this into account when we plan our next steps. So most of the people say add, add uh, support for other tasks, but let's see if, uh, if uh, the other topics get, uh, get some uh, voting power in the next uh, minute or so before I publish uh, the results. And I just, okay. I just, yeah. up the number yeah, one. I, I, I see that it's a bias. A... Yeah. I just created the bias and the answers. Yeah, how so? by uh, saying that uh, ad support for other tasks is the uh, number one thing. Oh, yeah. Far. So now, yeah, I see people are voting for the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, we should have tested you for leakage. <laughs> yeah. Don't build, don't build a model based on what I'm saying. That's a, gen a general smart, smart rule to, to take. Yeah. So uh, if anyone uh, still wants to impact, this is the time. Um, I'm going to close it uh, in the next uh, 15 uh, seconds. So it's go and go. Countdown. Yeah. So four, three, two, one. And here are the results. So this is actually really interesting because a lot of people voted for supporting for other tasks, but then well, the data is, of course, very small. It's not even uh, 30 people that answered. Uh, improve the embeddings drift check. Single out drifted segment is the next one. Uh, and then detect similar samples is the third one. Um, and, and additional integrity checks is not voted high. And normal text properties, only one person answered uh, this as the number one thing that they wanted uh, us to add. So we actually I, I take that as a, a sign that we did a, already a good job by now. Yep, I uh, I tend to agree with you. Great. Cool. So really, thank you everyone uh, for participating and listening. We'll upload this uh, recording of this talk, and of course, the notebook is up, so you can also uh, look at it uh, later on. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll um, fo follow us for the final final release in two weeks and for further uh, improvements and. Uh, and new checks to come. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much.